very warm welcome to everybody who is joining us today. My name is Catherine. Please call me Cat. And today's session, we are going to be reflecting and thinking all about sleep and how to improve our sleep. I greatly encourage you to be very active in the session. I know it's quite easy to talk about sleep hygiene, but then actually doing sleep hygiene might be a little bit more tricky and a little bit more complex. So please do feel free to come into the space to ask your questions, and we will have a number of spots where we can stop and pause and reflect. And we're also going to have a little bit of time at the end of today's session where we can have a little bit more of a of a discussion with each other. There should also be a form and a link that you can go to and please do to let us know what country you're from and what company you're from. And I really hope that you enjoy today's session in exploring sleep. So to get us started, um, one last thing I'm going to ask you to do is to please also pop off to menti.com. So if you just type in um, M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M, and if you can use the code 12724372, then you can answer a very, very um, brief question, which is, do you wake up feeling refreshed? and any kind of other thoughts that maybe you have about sleep. Um, maybe sleep, uh, you struggle to, um, to keep falling asleep, or maybe you keep waking up during the night, or maybe you have eight hours of sleep every day and you still feel a little bit groggy. Um, so the, the answers and engagement on Mentimeter are completely anonymous. I'm not going to see who they're from. Um, so come into Mentimeter and share a little bit with us. Do you wake up from your sleep feeling a little bit refreshed? or not. OK, so where are we going today? What are some of the areas we're touching on? We're going to think a little bit about why we have to sleep. What's the function of sleep? We're going to refresh ourselves in terms of some of the sleep cycles and the sleep stages. And then a quick reminder of generally speaking, how much sleep um, should we be getting? Uh, we're going to briefly go through some of the sleep disorders and particularly focus on insomnia. And then we're going to go into the how to's of uh, really trying to develop and practice good sleep behavior and good sleep hygiene. And we're going to last finish off on just another quick reminder of the supportive services from ICAS. OK. So let's start off with why do we even need to have some kind of sleep? And I can already see, gosh, there has been a, a flurry. Thank you so much for being so active and, and engaging. And I see the overwhelming vast majority of people are saying that actually, no, we're not waking up feeling refreshed. Um, sometimes one or two people are saying yes, um, but actually just on the weekends. It depends on the day, so OK, so context is quite important, but actually most people I've got to say are saying that no, not really. When we do have a little bit of sleep, then actually we don't land up feeling refreshed. So maybe this is a good point that I encourage everyone or oh, even pulled out of dreams. Somebody is saying that is very, very interesting. Uh, waking up during the middle of the night and then can't fall asleep. So if you'd like to keep some of those um, those qualities coming, you're also more than welcome to pop into the chat box space and to share some specific questions if you have any, um, or even some of the challenges. I know some people have already started um, to discuss their challenges, waking up in the middle of the night and then you can't fall back asleep. Um, you're not kind of comfortable just before you go to sleep. The mind is quite active. So maybe let's start sharing and we can start problem solving together a little bit about, you know, well, now what do we do? OK, so considering that certainly um, sleep is an issue and maybe it never used to be an issue, but maybe now with everything that we're going through and so many changes and disruptions that our lives have been through, we're not quite getting that amount of sleep, but also the quality of sleep as well, because remember there are two components. So sleep is actually an incredibly important function and our bodies are actually very active during sleep. Um, they're busy repairing themselves, our muscles are busy repairing themselves, but also psychologically it's a chance for almost our neuropsychology to kind of almost process, to get things into place, to kind of sort out all the pieces of the puzzle. So physiologically we actually need sleep to help restore and to help repair 
but also very specifically in terms of our cognitive processes, it really helps to consolidate a lot of our memories. So actually they say that, for example, if you're going through a period of studying quite a bit, uh, you should actually have a nice good sleep. And then when you wake up refreshed, hopefully the next day, it actually helps with memory recall. It actually helps with trying to really consolidate all the information that you have absorbed the day before. Okay. So sleep is actually quite an important health and well-being function that we need to pay a little bit more attention to. OK, and I'm going to keep keeping an eye um, and of course, children, I know that children is definitely a challenge when it comes to sleep. Um, and in fact, poignantly looking at the sleep cycle, which is also going to start to make sense of, you know, how long do we sleep for? Do we nap? Because when we go through the sleeping phase, we actually have to go through a number of those different phases and we need to get to the deeper levels of sleep to also really get a lot of that restorative power. So you can see here that there's about four different stages um, and we keep vacillating. We keep going through the different stages and moving through the different stages, cycling through the different stages. And what are some of those stages? And I'm not going to spend too much time on the different stages, uh, but essentially the first stage is like a transitioning stage that we're sort of we're starting to to get a little bit sleepy. Our bodies are starting to calm down. Stage two and stage three is really about the space of um, our, our heart rate decreases, our blood pressure decreases, our breathing rates start to decrease, and we start to get lulled into a really relaxed, physiologically relaxed space of sleep as well. But then when we come into the REM, and you can see there that the activity level goes up, and that's because actually our brains become quite active, but our bodies are quite immobilized. Now, the reason for that is that even though there's a lot of activity going on, you know, our minds are quite busy, our bodies are nice and still so that we don't move or shift around during our sleep as well. Um, so that's why it looks a little bit that curve, that activity levels start to go down, body starts relaxing, all the different physiological systems start to kind of slow down a little bit, and then the activation comes when we come into REM, which is the rapid eye movement and the space of dreaming as well. And we sort of constantly shift through these different spaces. And so this is going to make a difference in terms of how many hours, because we need to go through quite a number of these cycles during the course of an evening. So if we're only having short sort of snippets of sleep, it's not allowing us that kind of elongated stretch of going through the different cycles. So we may not feel as refreshed because maybe we didn't go through as many cycles as we needed to. We didn't get maybe to that depth of sleep. We only maybe got to stage two and then we woke up because maybe the dog was barking or we needed to go to the toilet or we had to get up for the baby or there's just lots of things in our minds that we couldn't relax enough to really get into that deep source of sleep. So, you know, thinking about all these components, it always adds into the quality and the amount of sleep as well. But speaking about the amount and the quality of sleep, um, these are general suggestions and general encouragements about how many hours we should have. And you can see that obviously the very young ones um, need to have quite a substantial amount of sleep. But on average, as an adult, we need between seven to eight hours of sleep every day. And there's a little bit of a debate in terms of can we catch up on our sleep? And there's one um, area of discussion that says yes, Absolutely, we can catch up on our sleep. Uh, you know, if we didn't get enough sleep during the evening, we can have a little quick cat nap and that can sort of add to our hours of sleep. And there's another um, um, argument that says actually we need to get those cumulatively all together in sort of one period of sleep. I am personally of the opinion that actually we can sort of collect and make good on hours lost of sleep. So actually maybe sometimes that catnap during the day of just 20 minutes of really solid sleep where we get into quite a deep sleep um, or just enough of a, a depth of sleep just to kind of feel a little bit refreshed afterwards does actually make a difference. But the big take home message here is that everybody is unique. 
Some people need five hours of sleep, six hours of sleep, and they feel good, they feel refreshed. But generally, again, the average is about seven to eight hours of sleep. So we, we should really try to think about structuring our day so that we can try to accommodate that amount of sleep. And maybe that's something that I can maybe connect with everybody here. And I'm actually going to come um, to some of the um, to some of the comments as well of maybe um, of what people are experiencing in terms of their sleep. Uh, but maybe that's something I can check in with everybody here today is on average, how many hours of sleep do you get and what do you think your golden number of sleep hours is? You know, do you actually function very well on six? Do you function very well on eight? Maybe you're a nine or even a 10. Because again, remember, if we sleep too much, uh, which I know that seems like a, a, an absolute mystical idea to think about, but if we sleep too much, it might also make us feel a little bit groggy and we kind of lose that attention. So if you'd like to maybe share for yourselves, what do you feel is your golden number of, of hours of sleep? Okay. OK, so only when I get at least six hours of sleep, anything less than that and I wake up tired. OK, so people are really starting to respond. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, some people are saying that they got a new mattress and um, that definitely is is helping in terms of actually having a lot of bodily pain as well. You see, all these components are really important and this is part of sleep hygiene is to actually start paying attention to all these different components of sleep. You know, what is your magical number of sleep? Do you feel that if you have an afternoon nap, it actually does feel refreshing or does it make you feel a little bit more groggy afterwards? Uh, maybe are those naps a little bit too long or they're a little bit too short? Because maybe if you're going into a, a deep sleep and you're waking up in stage three, um, then that's what's actually making you a little bit disorientated. So maybe you should only sleep for about 20 minutes if you're going to have a nap during the afternoon. OK, so it's about paying attention, understanding what are the different elements and components that are influencing our sleeping patterns as well. Now, I know that most of the difficulties that people tend to have is certainly insomnia, and there are a range of other um, sleep disorders. There's bruxism, which is about grinding one's teeth. Um, there's also a lot of sleep disorders where um, they, for example, sleepwalking, uh, where you're kind of in that REM state of sleep, but instead of our bodies being immobilized, um, something in the system has redirected some of those chemicals and hormones and now the body's able to walk so we're almost able to also act out our dreams as well but the main one that we're going to focus on today is really trying to explore um, insomnia which is one of the most common experiences but i think before we go into insomnia uh, maybe this is a point that i'm going to check in um, with my co-pilot today with kerry who is on the call with us as well and kerry are there any questions or comments in the chat box that we can maybe take a breather and explore a little bit yes, yes thank you kat we've actually had many questions um coming through so i'm going to just to give you a couple um, um, the, one of those is how do you retrain yourself to go to sleep sooner when you've been a night owl for most of your life? So great question there. Um, we also had a question about does it matter if you have two or three deep phases or longer phases rather than a larger number of shorter phases? And I think you partly did address that already um, in, in, in what you have covered. Um, then we also had a question about, um, you know, somebody working at night shift and, yeah. and on weekends wanting to be awake during the day to spend time with family, but then obviously having a hard time sleeping um, on a Saturday night. So sort of how could how could we address that? Mm -hmm. um, there are questions around sort of foods, supplements, caffeine and, and things like having your phone next to your bed, but I know we will be covering a lot of that in the presentation, so I think um, we can we can come back to that. Um, and then the question about somebody saying they, they sleep really deeply, they don't, they're not disturbed at all, but still wake up feeling tired in the morning, so that might be another one. I think that probably we can maybe pick up on some of the others later on. Okay. 
Wow, that is wonderful. Really great questions, Kerry. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone for coming into the space and asking such such lovely questions. Because I, I think probably a lot of people are struggling with very similar issues as well. Um, so in terms of retraining, now this is again, this is very much part of sleep hygiene because it's about really picking up on maybe some of the things or behaviors or processes that we're engaging in with sleep that maybe aren't as conducive to really creating this good quality of sleep. So I'm going to almost answer maybe two questions in one here. Uh, you know, Often we can maybe have maybe even five or six hours of sleep or, you know, when you have that great cat nap and you sort of, it's only 20 minutes or it's 30 minutes and you just wake up and you feel absolutely refreshed. And it's because you actually had a really lovely deep um, length of sleep and you went to kind of that, that really deep stage of sleep. So you feel really refreshed, it's restored itself, but it only maybe took you um, 20 minutes. And so, and maybe you were able to do that because you were really tired and you just kind of needed to find that balance. So it's very much about pay attention to what works for you. You know, the suggestion of seven to, to eight um, hours of sleep is very much on average for adults, but we're all different. So, you know, and I, I see a lot of people have put into the comments at the amount of hours that works for them, but really get a sense of how many hours works for you. Um, and when we want to retrain ourselves, the real key here is about consistency and it's about queuing. So we almost want to condition ourselves to help sort of um, cue us into a more relaxed state of sleep. And it's also to think about our entire day. And so this is also an answer to maybe the night shift question as well. You know, we want to think that when we go to sleep, we want to be in a state of tiredness. So we almost want to get our bodies and our minds into a state where we actually want to unplug, we want to de-stress, we feel sleepy, we feel tired. So we've got to think about all the components that can lead to that. So think about retraining yourself in the sense of it starts even from the morning or it starts from when your day starts. Um, so maybe it's about waking up and getting out of bed instead of hitting the snooze button. It's maybe about not having a nap during the day. It's about maybe not having stimulants just um, a little bit later at night, but we are going to come to these a little bit later on. So training is in terms of thinking about the entire process of your day um, from start to finish. What time do you wake up? How do you navigate your day? What are your stimulants? Um, how tired and sleepy are you at the end of the day? And then doing it consistently. So that consistency is almost going to be a bit of a cue for our bodies to go, oh, it's 10 o'clock or it's 11 o'clock, you know, or when the light goes off. So for example, if we are used to getting into bed and going on social media, then we start to associate bed with going on TikTok or Twitter, or Facebook or any of the, the social media apps. So it's just to be a little bit more mindful of the consistency, the conditioning and thinking about the entire day. Um, the deep phases, I think it has, um, I think we've spoken about that. I've referenced that as well. Um, and sorry, I think Kerry, there was one question I hope I managed to answer all of those questions. If I haven't, then come into the space and just let me know. But um, I think I managed to speak to, to all of those. But if I haven't, please let me know and we can have another break um, in, in a few minutes to, to continue to explore. Thank you, Kat. I'll keep an eye on it. Great. Thanks, Kerry. So in thinking about the different behaviors and patterns of sleep, insomnia is certainly one of the most common and universal processes um, that people struggle with. And it's really about the struggle of falling asleep where we constantly wake up or when we do wake up, we can't fall back to sleep again. So either we can't fall asleep or when we do fall asleep, we kind of wake up quite quickly and then we can't go back to sleep or we land up waking up a little bit too early and we just don't feel refreshed. So we can't fall asleep and we can't stay asleep. We can't go back to sleep. And 
you know, of course we're going to go through periods where maybe there's a deadline or there's a project and it's going to impact our sleep, but it's it's very contextually based. It's very temporary. It doesn't last for a very long time. Um, so, you know, we're going to go through periods where sleep is disrupted, but insomnia is when it starts to form a bit of a pattern. So there's a little bit more consistency. Um, it, it, so it carries on for a good couple of weeks as well. Um, so at least three times a week for a few months. Um, so it needs to be quite a substantial pattern and then it also starts to interfere with our daily functioning as well. So it, it starts to impact our work. It starts to impact how we relate to people. And there's a variety of different causes for insomnia. And again, remember, everybody is different. So everybody's story and, and, and process is different. It can be from psychological that we're worried about something, uh, you know, something's bothering us about um, a process that we're going through. Uh, maybe it's about something a little bit more to do with our family dynamics um, or our relationships. Um, that you know we're struggling in our our partnerships with people could be a medical underlying medical condition um, that we are struggling with and it's impacting our sleep. It could be hormonal, so something purely physiological. Um, there was a suggestion of night shifts and how to manage night shifts, and I know that I haven't quite spoken to maybe that enough, but certainly the disruption to circadian rhythms. And essentially circadian rhythms is is pretty much like our internal kind of alarm clock. You know, when we see sort of sunlight first thing in the morning, it kind of cues our bodies into um, releasing and um, distributing certain hormones that are going to start to wake us up. So it's almost like, you know, at different times of the day, our bodies will release and produce um, and sort of distribute different hormones. And so when we disrupt that, it kind of has an effect and our overall well-being as well. And again, a way to sort of navigate um, night shift processes is again, it's almost that retraining. And I know it can get a little bit difficult when we're constantly having to adapt to one system and then readapt to another system. It is possible, but it's just allowing ourselves to almost um, you know, adapt to a different kind of circadian rhythm function. So it's just to almost get used to sort of those disruptions a little bit. And also a variety of, of other risk factors. Maybe we're going through some digestive um, problems. Um, you know, maybe there's environmental noise and um, there's dogs barking. You know, um, having babies and little ones um, is definitely going to interrupt um, our way of, of sleeping as well. So a variety of reasons why we could be um, suffering and experiencing insomnia. So a couple of, of, of maybe signs and symptoms to look out for, because again, one of our biggest tools is about awareness. And here I'm going to encourage everyone to think a little bit about your own sleeping cycle. So think about your entire day, you know, from when you wake up in the morning to when you go to sleep at night. And you're almost trying to think, how can I start structuring my day? But also, how can you start picking up on some of the, I don't want to say problem areas, because, you know, we don't want to, uh, you know, have that sort of, uh, you know, sort of pathologize things. Um, but we want to pick up little areas that, oh, maybe I need to intervene here, or maybe I need to change that. Um, so as we said, some ways of picking up insomnia is that you cannot fall asleep, you cannot stay asleep, you wake up a little bit earlier than usual, you still feel tired even after a, a, a sort of a lengthy amount of sleep, you've got a little bit of that daytime fatigue, you just, you know, you just don't have that motivation. And we're going to come back to that a little bit as well in the next slide when we talk about depression. Uh, but certainly if there is a bit of um, irritability and depression, you know, depression and insomnia often really shake hands quite a bit. Um, so where there's one, there might be the other one as well. And certainly if you're struggling to make decisions and focus and concentrate, you're a little bit uncoordinated and it's kind of difficult to sort of physically navigate a lot of those spaces. If sleep is actually just on your mind and you're constantly worrying about it, so it's a bit of a theme for you as well, or any kind of bodily sort of um, processes that are just seeming a little bit unsettled, it's really about you know paying attention. 
you know, really trying to kind of be a little bit proactive in looking after, OK, what is my body telling me? What is what are these thoughts representing? You know, how am I feeling? How am I engaging with people? So these are all little little flags for us to just pay attention to. We're not going to judge them. They're not going to judge us. We're just going to pay attention. And so look a little bit at your day. Start to think about all the different components of your day. Start to think about, oh gosh, yes, um, I do get a little bit irritable or, you know, I have been a little bit, um, you know, my concentration has been a little bit off or, you know, we, we're just, we're paying attention. So I invite everyone um, to pay attention with me as well. And if you'd like to share that in the chat box space, that would be absolutely great. So as I was talking about insomnia and depression, you know, sleep is often one of the really lovely flags that we can use to sort of just tell us something's going on. We're not quite sure what it is, but something's going on. And the thing with sleep, and I think all the questions really referenced it, is that it starts to become a pattern in and of itself. So maybe one day we went through a period of really having to work a lot of hours. It affected our sleep. And then we kind of got into a pattern of getting used to it. So maybe we got used to going to sleep at two, three o'clock in the morning and then waking up at six o'clock in the morning. And now our bodies are just conditioned and cued into that space. And maybe with another a number of other um, factors that are involved, it's kind of maintained that particular pattern. So sleep, you know, can be due to a number of different processes. It's associated with um, a bit of anxiety and depression. You know, it's, it's part of a, a wide range of experiences. So we don't want to make assumptions, but it does give us a little bit of a clue as to, OK, something's happening here. Quite unique to depression, though, is because of the nature of depression. You know, depression, we do get a little bit low motivated. We do get a little bit low energy. We do kind of, um, you know, sleep might definitely be increased. We want to sleep all the time or we don't want to sleep at all. You know, that is, is quite unique to depression as well. Um, so certainly there is a little bit more handholding with sleep and depression. And sometimes when we're depressed, it leads to sleep problems, and sometimes when we have sleep problems, it can lead to depression. And that's quite important because oftentimes we almost want to, you know, we want to tackle and support the actual underlying process. So if we're just tackling the sleep, but actually we're feeling rather depressed, then we need to support the depression. You know, we need to sort of find ways of how can we help the depression? How can we help to process and sort of work through some of the, the sadness? And then that will inadvertently then have a, a positive effect on sleep practices. So it's just again, it's just to be aware and try to recognize some of these different spaces. OK. And so, Kerry, before I, I go into a couple of the, the tools and the how to's, which we've already started to discuss, I'm going to take um, a, a, a moment there and connect with you. Questions, reflections? Yes, hi, Kat. Uh, we've had many, many questions. We're not unfortunately going to be able to deal with any with all of them, um, but we did have a question. We, I'll, I'll just take you through some of them. So what if your circadian rhythm doesn't fit with your working hours? So ah. really gay, great question. And, and linked to that, we also had a question from somebody who um, lives in the APAC region, but actually works American or US working hours. And so is you know, sleeps during the daytime is a, and, and is working at night and sort of what is the impact of that? Yeah. Um, I think there's also there were questions around, you know, uh, people who sleep well during the afternoon, but are really battling to sleep at night. Mm. And, um, you know, is that a problem and how do we deal with that? Um, also questions about dreaming and, and whether vivid dreaming can impact on your quality of sleep. Oh. And um, Another good question, somebody who mentioned that they sleep really well on the sofa, but really struggle to fall asleep when they go to bed. Mm. Wow, what fascinating, interesting questions. This is what makes sleep such a, a really wonderful area to talk about, and it's something that we all do. It's something that we all have to do. So gosh, thank you, Kerry. That's um, really a lot of food for thought. 
OK, so my my suggestion and encouragement around the circadian rhythms and it doesn't quite match the time zone. So we're kind of uh, whatever area you're in, it doesn't quite match a lot of your own body rhythm. And OK, my, my biggest encouragement actually is to maybe even contact um, a counsellor uh, from ICAS because uh, at the moment I'm giving sort of very general ideas and sort of very general information. And I think if there is something quite unique and specific to your own journey, I think it would really help to actually speak to someone one on one where you can maybe tailor a particular journey to suit yourself. That can maybe you can find those small little tweaks and fine tuning to really help um, your process adapt to your lifestyle and to your context. Um, so actually, that's my my really greatest encouragement is, you know, make contact with ICAS and um, speak to someone that can really help go in a tailored journey for you. So if your circadian rhythm, I think what happens with circadian rhythm is that it can adapt. So if you do find your space yourself, for example, you've just gone to a different time zone and now you need to adapt. Now, this is what almost jet lag is about. It's it's really where our circadian rhythms and our body rhythms are trying to now adjust to, you know, in our, uh, for our bodies, it's 10 o'clock at night, but the country we're in, it is um, eight o'clock in the morning. So our bodies are saying, look, it's sleep time, but the place we're in is saying, no, nope, it's time to get the day started. But eventually, given a couple of days and really looking after ourselves, we can adjust. So, for example, like with jet lag, what they say is try to push past. So if for you, you've arrived in the country and it is eight o'clock in the morning, but your body is feeling, no, it's 10 o'clock at night, I need to be going to sleep. Try to push through that because it's almost like you're trying to get your circadian rhythm, your body rhythm to readjust. And it does readjust. And that's what often makes shift work so difficult is you can readdress, readjust, you can retrain, and it only takes a couple of days and a significant amount of discomfort. And there are certain things that you can do, you know, be gentle with yourself, hydrate, drink lots of, of water, look after yourself, be gentle. But, you know, it's to retrain, so push through a little bit of that sleepiness and tiredness so that you can start getting into a new rhythm. And of course, again, that's why shift work can be so um, difficult because you're constantly needing it to, to adapt every couple of months. Um, so if it isn't fitting, um, and again, I think for that particular person, there seems like maybe there's a little bit more to that particular process, um, but my general highlight is that we can adapt and we can sort of find. So maybe there are some other elements that are preventing um, the circadian rhythm, the own natural body rhythm from adapting to the place that you're in at the moment. And I think very similar to you, to the different time zones and gosh, I'm, you know, that definitely sounds um, like a bit of a challenge. And so I think in that case, it's about finding your own rhythm. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I know that if we are doing shift work and you've got to sleep during the day, but it's light outside, you know, a couple of tools and, and how to's is to maybe get um, curtains that can completely block out the light so that you can at least get a little bit of sleep in. I think there it's about finding your own rhythm. I know that certainly from the question before, you know, you still want to, to, to be with family during the day, so you don't just want to sleep completely during the day. You want to still get those things done. And so I think it's about being very intentional about thinking about how much sleep you need and then really putting into place a couple of practices where you can um, almost create a, a very unique rhythm for yourself. So it may not look like the, the eight hours during the evening and then all the wakefulness hours, your rhythm might look unique for you, but then that's going to be what you need in that particular space. So for instance, maybe it's about coming home and having maybe six hours of sleep and then still having a little bit of those daytime hours to spend time with family and then maybe catching up on sleep at a different time. But again, um, this isn't to give advice um, and to give almost instructions. These are just sort of ideas. And I would rather say to people, because you all have unique stories and specific 
um, situations, um, I would greatly encourage you to contact a counsellor and you can navigate in creating those specific rhythms um, for your particular situations. Um, so very much then I'm going to speak to the, the daytime napping. If you feel that the daytime naps, you, the person said that you sleep very well during the afternoon naps, great. If that's the rhythm that you get used to, you know, there's certain people that, you know, that's just their, their circle. That's, you know, that's their circadian rhythm. They sleep in the evening or they sleep a couple of hours, but then they have that maybe a little bit of an afternoon nap. But if it is interfering with your night time, but only if you feel that that is being disruptive to your life. You know, if you're getting the hours in and you're feeling refreshed, then I would say, is it a problem? So, you know, again, it, it's not that there has to be a very particular format. It's just that usually in our society, we're awake when the sun is out and we're asleep when the sun is down. Um, and generally speaking, we do need about eight hours of sleep. But if you have a particular rhythm that works for you and you feel refreshed, you feel healthy, it's adding to your well-being, well, then great. You know, we all have different contexts and different behaviors and rhythms and rituals. It's more about being intentional and doing little tweaks that is healthy and adaptive for your well-being. And certainly when we speak about dreams, Gosh, dreams are an absolutely fascinating area and there's a number of different arguments and approaches to dreams. Um, definitely one approach to dreams is that it's it's almost our mind's way of processing and trying to make sense um, of what's happening. So if we have a sort of an underlying feeling of anxiety, it kind of comes through in our dreams, but in quite a symbolic way. So we may dream about something that isn't necessarily what we worried about, but it's about the emotion playing out in our dream. Um, so whatever emotion was elicited in the dream that maybe is about something that you're going through um, in that particular moment of your life. But of course, there are very different approaches to dreams. And if that is something that you're interested in, I know certainly one tool that people use is as soon as you wake up is to write down your dream because we tend to forget our dreams quite easily. It kind of fades away a little bit like smoke in the air. Um, so if you are interested in maybe unpacking the symbology of your dream, as soon as you wake up, maybe write down um, what your dream was about. And again, that would be a lovely um, process to go through with a counselor just to maybe even explore, but what does the dream mean for you? Because really that's what it's about. It's, it's what does it represent for you? What does it maybe um, mean in terms of what you're going through at that particular time? Because of course, you know, maybe if we've had something food wise that's a bit heavy or it's a bit stimulating, uh, you know, maybe we're feeling fine, but just our bodies are kind of going through a bit of discomfort. Um, so it could be due to a number of different reasons. Wonderful. OK, so I hope that I have spoken and answered all those questions, but but now I really want to get into um, some of the tools and the specific behaviors that we've already spoken about, but I want to sort of go through them a little bit more intentionally. So sleep health and sleep hygiene, there are a range of different elements um, to explore. So certainly a bit of that regular exercise, um, not too close to sleep time, and this is because it's going to help our bodies feel nice and tired by the time that we get to the evening. It also just exercise is very good for our well-being. It gets all the hormones and all the chemicals up and running. So we're really thinking about stimulation here. You know, we're really thinking about, we really want to, again, try to cue and condition our body into a space of calm and relaxed, and tired. So if we are quite sensitive to any foods, or even if we're not, but if we may be drinking maybe alcohol even, or smoking maybe cigarettes even, um, drinking coffee sometimes for people, you know, anything that's going to, you know, cause us to be a little bit more activated, we might have then struggles in going to sleep. Eating a very heavy meal just before bedtime, because now our bodies have to do so much work to try to digest that meal. So that's why people say not to have a big heavy meal or a very rich meal just before bed. Um, another really lovely suggestion is don't force sleep. Now this is a bit of a cognitive tool. It's a little bit of a cognitive trick, because again here, 
when we force ourselves, we almost get stuck in a little bit of a looping pattern cognitively and bed starts to become associated with tossing and turning. And of course, the more we force ourselves, what happens? The more anxious we get, the more we kind of like go to sleep, go to sleep. It just it, um, it, it, it exacerbates the situation. It makes us more anxious. Uh, we, we become more frustrated. We get more and more worried. So actually, the suggestion is don't force it. If you're not tired, get out of bed, read a book. Try not to do anything too stimulating, um, but it, you almost want to break that pattern. So if you're tossing and turning, switch on the light. If you can switch on the light, get out of bed. But here, there's, there's maybe two different arguments. I remember doing the session once and somebody said that actually for them, doing strenuous exercise just before bed didn't actually, you know, activate their minds. It actually calmed them down and helped them to sleep well. My suggestion here is if you're tossing and turning, don't get out of bed and do work. But if that is maybe on your mind and that's what's worrying you and that's what's going to help you calm down, then OK. So. Again, you really want to think about breaking those patterns of conditioning, you know, break the cycle. Don't force yourself if you're not in that sleepy state. In fact, another trick is to almost force yourself to stay awake because you're, you're naturally going to get to a point of actually feeling quite tired. So, you know, we almost want to think of what's cueing sleep, what's preventing sleep, what is the pattern that I'm now getting used to? Um, and if working and just getting that off your mind is going to take away some of that anxiety, then great. If drinking coffee is actually the thing that puts you to sleep, then great. So be thoughtful about, you know, some of those nighttime rituals. And talking about ritual again, we really want to think about, OK, let's say we want to be asleep by 12 or by 11. So maybe by 10 o'clock we've got to start moving into a space of Maybe we have to have a bath or we drink a cup of tea or we read a little bit or we watch a little bit of um, movies or series. You know, whatever your nighttime ritual is. And again, I'm also going to remind us that there needs to be a morning ritual because we're thinking of the entire day. It's to think what can lull you into a space of calm and sleep. Talking about lulling us into a space of calm and sleep. Also think about your sleep environment. Um, so is it dark enough? Um, is there maybe a, a blue light from technology that is keeping you awake? Is the alarm clock a source of anxiety that you hear that sound and it just kind of makes your heart want to drop into your tummies? So, we, you know, we want to think, how am I responding to my environment? Is my duvet heavy enough? Is it light enough? Is my somebody mentioned about getting a new mattress? You know, do I have back problems? Um, is the color of my walls kind of keeping me awake um, and sort of stimulating me and activating my mind? So think about your environment. The consistency of our sleep, you know, when we kind of condition our bodies to go, OK, it's 10 o'clock, it's time for a bath, it's time to get into bed, our bodies become its own, again, natural circadian rhythm that it almost kind of takes over. But if we get into bed and we scroll and we watch, then yes, we're tired, but our bodies are now used to kind of just engaging in sort of that deactivated space, but still alert space. So actually technology just before bed, mm, maybe we need to rethink that a little bit because we don't want to activate, but still be tired because then we also get locked into another process as well. OK. And of course, as I said um, in the beginning, it's, you know, sometimes if you get too little or too much, so it's really about connecting to what does your rhythm need? You know, what does your space need to really help to provide a very um, consistent pattern and process of, of sleep hygiene? So again, a couple of more suggestions. Um, as I said, um, daytime naps, I am certainly a support of daytime maps, but there's another um, argument that says actually, you know, rather just cumulatively leave it all for the evening because if you're napping during the day, it's taking away the sleepiness of, at night. So if you are finding that, if you find that actually daytime naps are great, but then it interferes with your nighttime sleep, which is what the person said, um, then, you know, then maybe we need to scrap 
daytime napping, but a lot of people do find it. It just creates a little bit of that refreshment. But of course, sometimes um, people feel like, well, actually, I've got too much sleep and I woke up feeling worse. And that's because maybe we woke up when we were in quite a deep state of sleep. So that's why we feel disorientated. So generally, they encourage to have about 10 to 30 minutes. So you do get a couple of the, the peaks and the valleys but you don't go into too much of a deep sleep that it kind of disorientates one. Okay, and again, really, we, we do actually mean for sleep hygiene to be very mindful of the physical environment, um, the visually, smell-wise, uh, you know, hearing-wise, and think about all your different senses um, in terms of sleep hygiene. Um, so the temperature in the room and the type of bedding that you have, um, you know, of course, we know that if there are elements that are beyond your control, maybe actually sleep hygiene involves chatting with a neighbor about their barking dog that keeps yapping at two o'clock in the morning. Um, so again, we're thinking about holistically all the different elements of sleep. Um, and I'm going to go through a couple more techniques um, and then we're going to stop and have a, a little bit more one on one time. Um, some other lovely ways to really explore and expand on how to relax our bodies, because again, it's all about lulling our bodies and our minds into space of deep calm are specific and various relaxations. So stretching. So not physical strenuous um, exercises, but actually just very calming and stretching. Um, visualization is a lovely um, type of meditation, um, which is you, you visualize and sort of you imagine yourself in a very calm, very peaceful, or a space that can kind of induce that sense of calm sleepiness. Meditation proper, where you actually practice a bit of that mindfulness, um, and there are a variety of different techniques um, that can help with, with meditation. Breathing exercises. Um, I know it sounds simple, um, and it is simple, but it is super powerful because when we breathe, what do we do? We control our lungs, which controls our heart rates. And what happens when we control our heart rates? We can slow down our heart rates, which means we slow down all the different systems or the, the distribution systems in our body. So that can help just to induce that level of calm and even progressive muscle relaxation. A very quick way of describing that is, you know how you do a little bit of a stretch in the morning. You kind of get up, you wake up and you do this little bit of a stretch and it almost activates your body. Progressive muscle relaxation is a little bit like that. And it's essentially where you tense a group of muscles and then you release. And that sort of feeling of release is where that real deep sense of calm comes in. And how you do progressive muscle is it's progressive. So you almost you start off with the toes and you work your way up through the entire body. So you tense um, a particular muscle group and then you release and then you tense and then you release and then you move on to the next. So it kind of gives that sense of calm after you've released the muscle. A couple of behavioral um, approaches which we've already referenced before um, is that challenge your belief system. So this is where some of those thoughts land up being a little bit more invasive and they land up keeping us up. So this is where that anxiety, maybe even a bit of sadness comes in. And often what happens is when we can't fall asleep, we think, oh, today, tomorrow's gonna be disastrous or I have to wake up in a couple of hours and I'm gonna be so tidy and it's gonna ruin the rest of my day and it's gonna be disaster. And it's actually to reality test that. Think about the fact that you'll probably be uncomfortable. It won't be the most um, maybe energized day, but you're always gonna do what you're gonna do because you already have. You know, you've had days where you've had a little bit of sleep, but you still managed to do what you did. It was just a little bit uncomfortable and you were a little bit sleepy, but you still got through everything that you needed to get through. So it's, you almost want to challenge the belief and directly kind of get to um, the sort of the anxiety provoking um, area that you are in. Of course, I mentioned earlier about the uh, you almost want to force yourself to stay awake and that almost breaks you out a little bit of that looping pattern where we toss and we turn and we toss and we turn. We almost force ourselves to stay awake. So we actually then eventually, ultimately, we will get a little bit sleepy. If there's something that really is worrying us, then it's about 
um, you know, talk to someone, get it off your chest, um, write it down in a journal so that you don't have to carry those worries anymore. You know, have a little bit of a notebook um, right next to you so that you can sort of keep track of some of the things that you are you are exploring. OK, so just a last couple of suggestions. Um, I'm not going to go into this uh, with a lot of detail because it is such a personal and you do need to consult uh, with your um, general medical practitioner, but medication can certainly help. Um, there are a variety of sleep apps that you can explore as well, which we greatly encourage. Um, and certainly what we're going to, to really suggest to everybody is to, to be mindful, to be um, intentional about your sleep practices and your sleep um, processes. Uh, keep a bit of a journal that can track uh, what are the different elements that are either stimulating you or not stimulating you. Um, definitely make sleep something that we can talk about with each other so we almost can sort of support each other. Maybe there has to be a couple of boundaries, a couple of discussions and negotiations around sleep to really get those patterns and those rhythms in. Um, perhaps we can even do it as a family or as a team. And sometimes we have to make a little bit of that intentional commitment because it does take a little bit of practice and it does take a bit of that consistency. So as a last reminder, we are here to help from ICAS, uh, whether it's work or whether it's personal, we're completely confident um, it's for you and for your family. So remember, you know, we're here to listen. We're here to help think through, to help provide a different perspective. And so everybody, thank you so much for joining. I am going to come out um, of sharing mode so that we can actually connect a little bit more with each other. And we don't have long, but are there any other questions or comments, Kerry? Um, um, yes, yes, many, many again. again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, I would say one, one common one, one is that, that um, people are waking up at the same time, time every night. And why is that and what could they do? Hmm. So that, that is a, a frequent question. Um, we've also had a question about, you know, somebody who wakes up about an hour or 45 minutes before the alarm goes off feeling refreshed and then goes back to sleep until the alarm does go off and then it's waking up feeling very tired. Um, also some questions around TV. So some people who can only fall asleep when the TV is on or people falling asleep accidentally with the TV on, but then obviously not being able to sleep when going to bed. Um, and then also quite a lot of comments um, and, and discussion around things like weighted blankets um, and, and sort of the role of those. Um, people that are needing um, background noise in order to be able to sleep. So also some discussion around, um, you know, apps for white noise or background noise. So, so the role of those. Um, and other than that, I would say also just some questions you've already discussed exercise. So sort of there was a question about what is the latest time that I should exercise in the evening. And then in just one last interesting question that we somebody asked about, um, you know, why is it at lunchtime I have a heavy meal? I can sleep beautifully after that, but um, at night it's interfering with sleep. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Kerry. What what really lovely, what really lovely questions. OK, um, so so let me quickly first chat about um, the TV being on and weighted blank blankets and background noise, because I think those are kind of almost all a little bit in the, the same area. And for me, if it works for you to lull you into a space of sleep, because it's really about that sense of comfort, it's about that sense of um, you know, the weighted blanket can be a very reassuring and it just means that, you know, there might be a whole psychological process around that, but there's something very comforting then about having this kind of cocoon space around us. Um, you know, when we think about sleep hygiene, it's to literally think about every single one of our senses. You know, for one person, it might be the, the tactile, you know, that we need to feel that kind of heaviness. And um, for other people, it's about smell. For other people, it's about the softness of the linen. Um, so, you know, it's about really connecting with what is going to um, help your body to come into a space of feeling calm, feeling settled. And that's often what that background noise is about. Um, you know, that people, they find it a bit comforting that there's just a little bit of noise. And again, there's 
you know, could there be could be a whole variety of psychological reasons why that works. Um, one of the reasons is that um, there's a bit of a comfort in just hearing a little bit of noise instead of the silence. Whereas for other people, the silence in itself is incredibly calming and incredibly containing. But sometimes, um, sometimes we need the sound to almost help manage a little bit of those racing thoughts. I know certainly that's a lot of the theory behind the apps. So we already mentioned that there's headspace, um, there's also the calm, um, and there's a lot of sleep stories. And it's essentially just to kind of have a, a little bit of that distracting background noise where we just we eventually just hear someone talking, but we don't we're not actually registering the story at all. Um, and it's the same with the TV in the background, and it's the same with a bit of white noise. There is also a little bit of um, sleep science around that, that particular sounds actually um, directly impact and target some, some brain waves as well. Um, so I, I think it's really about just thinking of what is going to help be conducive in terms of all of my senses. And I think it's certainly in terms of the person um, who said that, you know, you're waking up at night and I'm also going to address the, the napping in the afternoon. I think think about it in terms of your entire day's rhythm and think about it in terms of what have we conditioned our bodies to get used to. Now, remember, if we want to retrain our bodies because we can retrain, you know, these things aren't made in stone, so we can kind of tweak and push and pull and create a different sleeping routine. Um, but it is going to take a little bit of work and it is going to take a bit of practice. This, of course, I'm not talking about if there are maybe other difficulties like insomnia or narcolepsy or, or other sleep disorder spaces, then it is going to take a little bit more intervention, but we can certainly readjust and adapt um, to different processes of sleep as well. Um, so Kerry, I am just aware of the time and just to think if there are any other questions, I hope that I've answered those sufficiently. Thank you, Kat. There is one and it's something I know came up in this morning's session as well. Um, what about snoozing your alarm? Is that a good thing? Is <laughs> a bad thing? Right. Um, yes, actually, I think that was one of the questions you asked as well. Look, again, I, I think it's about everyone's rhythm and everyone's routine is, is very different. Um, Generally, the thoughts around snoozing is to not do it. Generally, the thought is when the alarm goes off, get out of bed because the problem of what happens. And I think it was that question of the person wakes up before the alarm and then goes back to sleep and then wakes up groggy. And I think there it's about you know, your body's gotten used to waking up at a particular time, let it. You know, that's the kind of circadian rhythm. Um, but, you know, if you do like to on the weekends, you know, have a little bit of that sense of, yeah, I can go back to sleep. But maybe the person woke up in a state of, you know, quite suddenly from a very deep sleep. So that's where that orientation comes in. But when it comes to snoozing, we do condition ourselves then to, to the alarm goes off, then we condition ourselves to go back to sleep. So generally the, the encouragement and suggestion is to not snooze when the alarm goes off, get out of bed, get the day going. And if you do need to sleep a little bit longer, then maybe we need to wake up a little bit later if we can, um, or go to sleep a little bit earlier if we can. So generally, yeah, we do encourage people to, to, not, to not use that snooze button. Yeah, I know it's tempting though. <laughs> Great, thanks so much. Kat, I think just one last question. There was a question around how many REM cycles are ideal. Is, is there a right number? I think generally the recommended amount or the sort of average amount is about four to five. Um, I think it's about that the REM cycle lasts for maybe about 90 minutes or so. Um, so maybe it's about, yeah, about between four and five. But again, everyone is different. Um, you know, some people maybe need a little bit fewer, some people maybe need a little bit more. Um, but on average, that cycle is about, yeah, it's about one and a half hours. Um, so we need maybe four or five of those all together. Yeah. I know I said that was the last question, but I, we've also had a really nice one that's just come in. Um, somebody's asked the question about, we often hear um, we should be getting a good sleep before midnight. Is that true? Should we be aiming to get more as much sleep as possible before midnight, or is it more about the, the cycle, or is it more about the number of hours? I, you know, I, I think it's, 
the first thing I think I want to say is, you know, if that works for you, then maybe that's just kind of maybe what your body needs. And also remember, you're thinking about sleep, not just sleep, but it's about the entire day. You know, so we're thinking about from when we wake up. So if we are waking up and having, you know, this really intense morning, so by the time it reaches like five or six o'clock, we are finished. Um, you know, so when you think about sleep, thinking about it really more holistically, from when we wake up to when we go to sleep. Um, generally, that's not something that I'm very familiar with um, to get sleep before 12 o'clock uh, or to get that good amount of sleep. Because also remember, if you have a number of cycles, it's going to go past the, the 12 o'clock number. But again, maybe that is what your body particularly needs. So listen to your body. You know, I think that's really the, the big take home message today. We need to listen to our bodies. Great. And then if I could just make one request, I have just placed a link in the chat. If I could ask everybody who's still on the call, please, if you could just take a couple of moments to go and complete that evaluation form. Um, it really is helpful for us to get some feedback on how you have found today's session. Yeah, wonderful. But thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you so much, Kerry, um, for your support. Thank you so much, Linda, for your support. And again, I, I agree. I hope that people connected and resonated uh, with some of the, the suggestions today. Great. Thank you so much, Kat. Thanks, everyone. Take care.